I was invited to speak at the Indie Book Fair in Johannesburg on the 20th of March, 2015. The topic I was given was literature and social development. And I must confess that initially I was quite intimidated because my background is, is medical um, and not really the liberal arts. But as I began to think about it, I realized just how much literature is at the core of social development. And so I modified the topic slightly to be a little more directive. How literature can bring about social development in South Africa. And I'd like to start with apologies to Alexander Dumas, the author of Three Musketeers, whose rallying cry, all for one, one for all, really epitomizes the solidarity that is at the heart of social development. And what I'd like to talk about is what those key factors are that help to convert human development, um, the development of the individual to social development, the, the development of a society as a, as a whole built on a spirit of, of solidarity. And what I hope to be able to show is really just how literature is at the core of shaping social solidarity. So let's start building up our understanding of social development, which really can be defined as how groups of people thrive together. And in order to understand how groups work together and how they thrive together, we have to understand the basic of human development, which really is about capacitating the individual. And one of the best known frameworks for thinking about this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And Maslow proposed that we have a certain set of needs which are contingent on each other so that our most basic needs, our most visceral needs, are the physiological needs of water or food that need to be met before we are concerned about safety. And safety needs need to be met before we think about love and belonging, our own self-esteem. And ultimately, once all of those are, are achieved, only then can we achieve self-actualization. Now, he used this very sort of hierarchical approach, which others have disagreed with. And another way of looking at human development is through the work of the Chilean economist Max Neff, who said that there are different domains of human development that interact with each other, that are not necessarily contingent on each other. For example, leisure, creativity, freedom, identity, affection, understanding, protection, participation. These are the domains which need to be fulfilled simultaneously and not sequentially. Whatever your view of human development, social development must be regarded as more than the sum of the individual human capabilities. There are factors that drive us together as individuals, that hold us together in solidarity. I've called them the three musketeers of social development. Those factors that are all for one and one for all. And drawing on the work of Martha Nussbaum, I identify them as empathy, the ability to see yourself in others, critical thinking, our understanding of different perspectives, the ability to change our minds, to learn through different experiences, and imagination, which really is at the heart of innovation and progress. So as you all know, these two world views have tended to polarize society. And I guess the question is, is can we combine the two worldviews? Can we look at it differently? What would the tools be that enable us to look at it through a different lens? What if our paradigm is both human development and economic growth? So that our strategy is to build human, financial, social, and cultural capital simultaneously to achieve both strong economic growth and each person in society achieving his or her full potential. So that ultimately the social development impact that we're seeking is that every person and the average person is better off and can participate fully in society. And the gaps between rich and poor are narrowed. Well, let's have a look at it through a different lens. And the one that I'm more familiar with, I guess because of my background, is that of human biology. So let's start at the very beginning, when the sperm and the ovum come together to form a fertilized egg. 
which very quickly splits, divides into the blastocyst. Within a couple of weeks, the embryo is visible. And very soon you can see that so much of the effort of the embryo is directed to brain development. The blood vessels pumping the rich nutrients from the mother through into the brain. Within six or seven months, there's no more space for expansion in the brain cavity. And so, so the brain actually starts to fold on itself, convoluting so that it, it, it can cram as many neurons as possible into a small space. But it's not only, it's not only a, a matter of amassing neurons, but those neurons start to connect with one another as they're stimulated. And so, in fact, you start to get the broad band of the brain being laid down. As the nerve cells are stimulated, they start to connect to each other. The nerve cells to do with sight and hearing connect to uh, the part of the brain to do with emotion, with movement, with planning, with thinking, um, until an incredibly sophisticated architecture is laid down. And it's amazing to see that the, that the period of most rapid brain growth is in fact in the last trimester of pregnancy and the first three months of life. And what's happening here is that really the, the broadband of the brain has been laid down. The time when the brain is most susceptible to stimulation and the type of connections that, that have been made are laid down in circuits uh, that ultimately form the scaffolding for the rest of a, of a child's life. And it's amazing to note that the stimulation we're talking about is, is not hugely sophisticated. It's basic, basic building blocks, food, love, security, stimulation. And so we know that, that if a child receives those inputs, food, love, security, stimulation, in the first thousand days of life, that child gets onto an upward trajectory that is compounding, uh, that is exponential as skills beget skills. And, and that's really the, the thinking behind the evidence that we now have, that early childhood development is the most powerful investment in human capital that a country can make. So powerful, it's got these incredibly powerful compounding returns that, that helps to achieve um, greater equality, better health, better education, a stronger economy, a better society. A fascinating insight comes from Nelson's book, From Neurons to Neighborhood, where he shows that the rate of formation of synapses, the rate at which the brain is, is most sensitive to stimulus for sight and for hearing, is at three months of age. For language, the rate of development peaks at nine months of age, and for higher cognitive function at about two to three years of age. So the point is that the, the time of infancy is a time of great opportunity and of great risk. If a child's brain gets primed uh, through love and through play and through talking to a child, that brain develops maximally. The architecture gets laid down. But if a child is not and misses out that period, it's almost impossible to make it up. And so the question is, what are the activities that can help to stimulate the brain, to prime the brain, for example, uh, for language and for communication? And they're very basic activities. It's the serve and return that is achieved through an infant gurgling and burbling and the mom responding. It's through storytelling. It's through enabling a child to draw and scribble, pretend play games and nursery nursery rhymes, uh, the I spy, I see you, interactive storybook reading. These are the basic activities that can prime language and communication. And language and communication is so critical because it's at the heart of both literacy and mathematics development. I think for most of us, we understand the relationship between language and literacy development, but we often forget that mathematics is simply a language of symbols. And it's very much dependent on exactly the same sort of brain development as that which is necessary for literacy. So, so we could say, if you like, that language and communication is the bedrock on which human capability is built. Let me illustrate with examples from a couple of studies that have shown the strong relationship between early vocabulary development, the ability to use lots of words, and later reading comprehension and understanding. So children who are able to understand and use a lot of words at 15 months, two years of age, do better at school in terms of comprehension, understanding, when they're in grade three, grade four, grade five. And so just to really refine or qualify 
our understanding of language and communication as the bedrock for developing human capability, a critical mediator of that human capability is the ability to understand. Without the ability to understand, without the ability to comprehend, it, it's very difficult for a person to participate in society. And as people understand, as they, as they start to comprehend what they're reading, that then opens up a whole world of literature. And literature builds those three musketeers of social development. Literature builds a sense of empathy. You're able to relate to people in stories. It builds the uh, sense of critical thinking, your ability to engage with different perspectives, to see from, uh, from different worldviews, and it builds your imagination. So we can say without fear of contradiction that on the 20th of March, 2015, the date of this presentation, two children with pretty much the same potential were born in Johannesburg. One of those children will seize the opportunity, will get onto that exponential trajectory of growth and development and thrive and the other child won't. And one of the big factors distinguishing those two children is how many words they hear as they grow up. A study from the UK that you probably heard of showed that, that by the time children were three years of age, those of professional parents had heard 35 million words more than the children of families receiving welfare benefits. And so the disparities that begin in the first few years of life are simply magnified over the course of a child's life. Let me illustrate from the annual national assessments of, uh, of school performance that are conducted uh, in South Africa. And, and here I look at two measures. The, the proportion of children who pass, let's say 50% is a pass, uh, for home language development and for mathematics. And we, we can see on this graph that 57% uh, of, of grade threes passed using that measure, 50% pass rate, which had declined by grade nine to just over a third. For mathematics, the differences between grade three and grade nine are even more stark. In grade three, three-fifths of, of children passed using that measure. By grade nine, only 2% of our children scored more than 50% for mathematics. And while we tend to focus at what happened between grade three and grade nine, we often forget that those children, in fact, are on two fundamentally different trajectories of growth and achievement. So my challenge to the audience at the Indie Book Fair was to recognize the power that they, the audience, uh, publishers, authors, the power that they hold, um, not only to produce books, but also for social development in South Africa. And so I asked them, what, what can you do? Um, and I suggested that there are at least five possibilities. The first is that as a country, we need to make a major fuss about storytelling and the importance of reading from birth. So many people think that, that um, reading only starts at three or four or five years of age. Let's change that mindset. Let's get parents to understand that the moment they bring their children home from, from the hospital, from the clinic when they're born, uh, initiate storytelling. Tell stories every night, even to your infant that you think is not beginning to understand. Secondly, bring your stories as authors, as publishers, into the lives of children by giving special rights, special broadcast rights, special publishing privileges to national campaigns like Nali Bali. Let's find a way of leveraging what we do. Third, we need to embrace new media. We don't have enough books in South Africa. Funz is a fantastic example of how mobile has been used. Teenagers are able to download chapters of books and read them on their own mobile phones. Fourth, we need to model good practices of reading and storytelling and comprehension. Often children are made to stand up reading, read a little element of a book, an abstract from a book. The very next child is asked to stand up and read exactly the same. And, and in fact, the, the, the class never gets to the end of the book. The book loses its meaning. The story is never complete. And finally, we have such a wealth of storytelling in South Africa that needs to be reactivated, that needs to, needs to be rejuvenated. And so as publishers, as authors, as others who are interested in the development of literature for social development in South Africa, let's go out, find a tree where people are sitting under telling stories. Let people tell their own stories and let's publish them. So the three musketeers, the three agents 
uh, that are implicit in literature that help us to achieve social development are those of empathy, of critical thinking, and imagination that drives innovation, that drives progress in a society. Thank you very much for listening to my story.